Hello everybody, I'm Arnaud, working at the SciLab, the Cyber Defense Lab at the Royal Military Academy. And today we will talk about the blockchain and the software supply chain security. So first of all, what is the software supply chain? If we take the formal definition, the software supply chain is a sequence of library, tools, software components developed by a third party that are used to facilitate day-to-day -day operation or the development of a software. It might still sound a bit obscure, but just remember that every time that you download something, uh, an executable or anything else, you put your trust in a third party, somebody that you don't know to provide you a functionality that you expect. And that's basically what is the software supply chain. Let's see some example um, of the software supply chain. And before that, I like to always do a, bit, a little difference uh, and, and mention two different types of software supply chain. The service, the first one is the service software supply chain. Um, this is basically when you download a software and you receive an executable directly and you just execute it and that works out of the box. Um, that's basically the case for if you use the Spotify app, if you use a Gmail app, or basically any app that you might use on your day-to-day -day basis. There is also another possibility. Imagine if you're a big company, you might want to rely on a software to manage your employee and payroll and all those things. And that's, for example, what SolarWind is doing. You just pay a subscription and you receive the software to manage um, your, your company, basically. And then on the opposite, you have the cloud software supply chain. And that's basically every library that a developer might use when developing a software. Because nobody is developing software from scratch. You always rely on libraries uh, to help you uh, when developing a software. Uh, so for example, we can talk about jQuery React for the web development, but it's working for any libraries in any language. Um, there is still a, a, a difference between those two, and that's why there is two type here. Most of the time, it's not always true, but most of the time, the code software supply chain will be open source. That means that everybody can see the code and then audit the codes. Everybody can modify the code and everybody can distribute the code. That's most of the time not the case for the service software supply chain. For example, with the Spotify app, you just receive it and you don't have any view on the codes. But the question now is why software supply chain security matter? Well, first of all, because as we saw, it's everywhere. Every time you use an electronic device, you put your trust in a third party to achieve something, to give you a functionality. So every time you use an electronic device, you expose yourself to a software supply chain. Uh, but also because it introduced a new attack vector for malicious actor. Now, instead of having to compromise each user individually, you can target only one library, so on, only one software. And the software or library will then be distributed to all the users. So that means that by hacking or breaking into only one thing, you will be able to compromise a lot of users. So that's really valuable um, from a, an attacker point of view. Um, that's really worth it. Also, because as you can see with those few titles, there is a lot of attack on the software supply chain. It's happened multiple times per week that new attacks are discovered. Uh, it can also be become political. If you know that a country is using this kind of software in their institution, you might try to break into the software supply chain of this specific software 
And when you manage to do that, you will also be in the institution of that country. Uh, that's exa exactly what happened with uh, the solar wind that I mentioned previously. Uh, the solar wind was used by the US institution. Uh, they got hacked. Um, and basically every US institution using solar wind was then exposed and hacked. So now let's have a look at the software development life cycle. Um, most of the time now, software are developed following what we call an agile approach. That means that you always develop and try to improve your, your software. Uh, it always starts with the analysis phase. You try to understand what are the issues uh, that your program will try to solve. Then you put you go to the definition phase where you say, okay, we will focus on those issues and the design. Uh, design is how you will address those issues. And then, and it's only the fourth step, you start coding your, your, your software, your solution. And that's where the software supply chain come in. Um, because like I said previously, um, nobody is cutting everything from scratch. You will always rely on, on, on a third party um, to provide you a functionality that you don't want to code again from scratch. Um, and then it goes into testing, deployments, and then you start again. That means, as you can see, that the software supply chain is not really in the loop. Uh, but if you manage to compromise this box, this software supply chain box, you compromise the entire loop, which is really powerful. Now let's focus on the code stage and see how it works to better understand the security and how we can secure the software supply chain. Uh, for now, software development follows uh, what we call a continuous integration and a continuous deployment methodology, a CI-CD methodology. You maybe already heard about that. Uh, this methodology can be decomposed in three main stages. We have the first one, which is what we call the development. It's when the developer writes codes. That's really the first step. Then you will have the building stage where all this code, which is written, will need to be compiled to an executable. And finally, now that you have your, um, your executable ready, you need to make it available for the end user. And that's the distribution phase. So if we look now at the attack vector on the software development uh, lifecycle, uh, we can see again those three phases. On the left, you have the development phases. That's when the developers write the code. And obviously that introduces the very first attack vector. You can compromise or impersonate the developer. And if that's the case, you will be able to push code to the source control, to the source repository, because that's how it works. When you write codes, most of the time, then you will push it to a source repository. And uh, probably the most known of every source repository is GitHub. And you will push that code there. If you manage to impersonate the contributor, you can push some malicious code in his name. And then we have the source repository compromission, which is also another possibility uh, for an attacker. If you manage to break into the source control server, you can change directly there the, the code. That means that you don't have to impersonate the developer. You can just change it directly on the server. Then we see the second phase, which is, you remember, the building phase which is, again, the same thing. You have one server which will be responsible for running the build process. Again, same issue. If someone compromises that server, if someone is capable of breaching the server, it can modify the build system. It can change the file that are compiled. It can change everything. So again, the output will not be what the developer expected. As you can see, we also have this dependency box here. Uh, and that's 
basically uh, again the software supply chain um, because when you build software like i said you rely always on libraries and that's where those libraries i build i put into your software so that also introduces a vulnerability if you use a bad dependency if you if your dependency is compromised then your software will also be compromised we have a loop here um, and then we have the third phase the third stage which is the distribution now that your software is built you will push it to uh, another server which will be the package repository to make it available for the end user and the end user will just ask to download the package from this repository again if someone managed to break into that server it can give to an end user a completely different software than what he expects Again, if we take the example of Spotify, you want to develop the, to download the Spotify app and someone will give you another software instead, which is, as you can imagine, really bad. So if we try to summarize a bit, we see that we have two main attacks vector uh, on the software supply chain. We have the human one and we have what I call the server one. Um, the human, there is not a lot of things to do. Um, use strong password, use signature when you develop code, uh, and use strong 2FA, two-factor authentication, uh, or at least use two-factor authentication. It's always a good idea. Um, but that's everything that can be done. For the server attack vector, we saw that the issue comes from the server being compromised because every time there is only one server. If this server is compromised, then the entire pipeline is compromised. So the idea would be to, instead of relying on only one server, let's try to rely on multiple server. So achieve what we call a decentralization. We go from a centralized thing with only one server to a decentralized thing with multiple server. So how to achieve this decentralization? Well, you probably guess it, we will use the blockchain because it's decentralized by nature and unmodifiable by nature. And we will also use a decentralized file system, which is content based addressed like the interplanetary file system uh, which I will refer to as IPFS in the following. Um, so let's see a bit how this works. So what is blockchain? So we'll try to resume a very complex topic in a very few slide. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask them at the end, or if you want to get in touch just to discuss those beautiful technology, don't hesitate neither. So a blockchain is basically just a replicated database that records related data with eventual consistency and protect integrity of those data. But the really cool stuff about blockchain is the two bullets here. The first one is that this uh, consistency over for the data is achieved with no central authority, which is when you think about it, really cool. You don't have to put your trust in an individual or an organization. The system in itself is made such that you can have trust. And the second bullet is even more impressive is that this trust can be achieved even if you have untrusted participants, even if there is malicious participants in the, in the system, which is when you think about it, it's really amazing. You can build something trustable from something untrustable. That's really cool. Well, as you guess, blockchain is just a chain of block. But now the question is, what does those block contains? Well, it contains a lot of things. Uh, we will just focus on the main thing here. It will first contain a link to the previous block. 
uh, and that make the same the, the chain you guess it it will contain a timestamp it will contain the data that you want to store on the um, on the blockchain and it will also contain a hard to compute compute hash this hash is basically like a big black box you put something in the inside and it will give you a value on the outside um, you input something and you will receive a value as an output so let's have maybe a bit more visual example so here is an example of a blockchain uh, on the left you have the very first block as you can see we have the data as we mentioned we have the timestamp we have no parent because of the first block so there is no nothing to refer to and we have the hash of that block then in the middle you see that we have a new block with a new data a new timestamp now we have a parent hash and if you look carefully the parent hash is the value of the previous hash and then we have the hash again of that block the third block is again a new data new timestamp um new parent obviously and the hash is still to be uh, need still need to be uh, computed so as you can see just because they are linked together and the way they are linked together if you want to change the new block the last block the present you have to rewrite the entire history and that's why we said that blockchain is impossible to unmodif to to modify we still have one uh, concept to go through. It's a smart contract. Uh, I will be very fast. Even though that's a really uh, the complex and fascinating topic. But a smart contract is a piece of code executed by the node participating in the blockchain. And once completed, the execution is trackable and irreversible. If we say it in another way, a smart contract is just a piece of code that will be executed by a computer participating in the blockchain network and the result of that execution will be stored on the blockchain in the data field so now what is the interplanetary file system ipfs well ipfs is a decentralized file system which is content-based address so if we look on the left we have the current web architecture even Every time you use HTTP, HTTPS, that's what happened. You go to a central server that holds your data or the data you want to retrieve. Let's say that you want to retrieve beautiful cat.png. You go to that server, you ask for it, and it gives you back. It gives it back to you. IPFS on the right is different. You see that there is no central server anymore. The data is stored on every computer participating in the network. That means that if you want to retrieve beautifulcat.png, you can ask to anybody in the network. But now, what does content address mean? A content address system is where an asset is retrieved based on its content rather than based on a location. Like we said previously, you go to a central server because you reach this server based on a URL, based on IP, whatever. But that means that if that server tomorrow decide to change the asset for beautifulcat.png, you will receive something completely new, something completely unexpected. On the opposite, a content address will always give you what you expect because you create a system not based on the location an ip address or a url but based on a content you will take the file beautifulcat.png you will put it once again in a hash function you will get a unique identifier also called cid as an output and then you will always create for this cid and you know that you will always get the exact same beautifulcat.png So now let's put that everything together to try to solve 
the issue on the, the, the centralization of the package repository. So now that your package is built, let's bring the centralization on this distribution phase. So we can store the package on IPFS, which is CID, so the hash, right? The content of that file. Then, because it's easier to remember a name, beautiful cat.png, rather than a hash, we need to store the mapping of this CID to a name, right? Beautiful cat.png. We could go to one central server once again, but then we are back to the same issue. So that's where the blockchain and the smart contract kick in. You will, we will just store this mapping on the blockchain saying beautiful cat.png equals that CID, that's hash. Now, if I want to retrieve beautiful cat.png, I will first query the blockchain saying, can you give me the CID of beautiful cat.png? And I will retrieve the, 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 I will receive the hash. Then with that hash, I can go to the IPFS network and ask for the file. And I know that every time I will receive the exact file I'm expecting to. So how exactly does it solve? I, we, we already give some hint about it, but the data is stored on the blockchain. And I mean, the data, the mapping is stored on the blockchain, which means that it's kind of secure and at least cannot be changeable because like we see, if we need to change a mapping now, we need to rewrite the entire blockchain, which is, if not impossible, really unlikely. And also what happened if a node tried to be malicious and give you another file on beautiful cat.png? Well, you will easily notice it because the hash will not be the same. So you will be able to detect that the, the file is not the one you expect. And in that case, you can simply put this node as malicious, never go back and ask anything to him again, and just pick any other nodes and ask for your beautiful cat.png. So that's how we can solve the package repository compromission attack vector by decentralization. So thank you. And if you have any question, feel free.